The children may be dismissed at this time. Set my stuff down. If you have your Bibles handy, um, I think probably Mark chapter 2 would be the first one to turn to. I'll be putting the scriptural addresses up on the board this morning, but uh, we will be journeying a little bit in the text. So just to warn you in advance, have the text nearby. Um, We are continuing in our church membership series, and this week we're going to look at one more supplemental study related to divine healing. Uh, Last week we unpacked some of the theology behind divine healing. In particular, in, in particular, excuse me, we looked at the subject of physical healing being part of Christ's atonement. And in the process we saw that praying for God to heal us was a perfectly rational thing to do. It's a perfectly biblical thing to do. In fact, the Bible encourages us to pray for healing. Uh, one of the clearest examples of this is seen in the book of James. Uh, we quoted, we, we, uh, quoted this verse last week. Uh, we're going to look at it again, but this time we're going to look at it in much more detail. So here is the passage we quoted last week, uh, and this, this week we're going to look at it again. Is any among you sick? Then he must call for the elders of the church, and they are to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. That is James chapter 4, verses 14 through 15. Now breaking this passage down, we see three ideas that I'm going to give to you briefly. Uh, And then we're going to zero in on the one that's going to be the subject of our study this morning, okay? Firstly, these are not up on the board. I'm just going to kind of give them to you briefly because they're not the the main focus of our study. But if you want me to uh, go over these again with you afterwards, don't hesitate uh, to ask. But firstly, uh, this passage says that those who are sick are encouraged to call for the elders of the church to both pray over them and to anoint them with oil. Do you see it there? Uh, Those who are sick are encouraged to call for the elders to both pray over them and anoint them with oil. And the Greek word translated anoint here indicates the application of oil medicinally, which was common during this time. Oil was an important medicine. It was an important uh, medical thing. And so James is saying that the elders should be called upon to bring both prayer and medicine. And that's important. That's something to realize. That's the first thing. Next, according to this passage, the sick are restored by the prayer offered in faith. You see it in verse 15. We'll talk about that again. But the sick are restored by the prayer offered in faith. And according to James, the Lord will respond to this type of prayer by raising the sick person up from their sickbed. Okay? And lastly, If sin happened to be the cause of the person's sickness, that sin will be forgiven as well in the process. If sin happened to be the cause of the person's sickness, that sin will be forgiven as well. That's talked about in verse 15 too. So we have a number of things going on in this little passage. Some of it's very practical. Uh, For for example, we learn uh, here that divine healing is not an either-or thing. This verse teaches us to use our common sense and to pursue the obvious medical options available to us while at the same time praying for God to heal. And uh, that's an an encouraging thing to realize. It's not either-or. It's not that we're using medicine or praying. We're doing both. Just as in New Testament times, the elders of the church brought both prayer and medicine when the sick were in their midst. But some of it is also very controversial. Uh, This verse seems to plainly teach that though sin is not always the cause of sickness, sometimes it is. And this is not the only New Testament passage that suggests this. There are others. Unfortunately, this is a whole subject in and of itself. So I'm going to try to give you more details about this when I publish the discussion questions tomorrow or Tuesday, and hopefully we can unpack this more in small groups. I realize that I'm opening up a can of worms here when I talk about sickness and sin together, and it's not fair for me not to go into it, but it really isn't related to what we're talking about this morning. So I'm going to try to give another format, but I just wanted to make you aware that it is in there. This actually is talking about sin as related to sickness, and that can be troubling. So we'll try to unpack what that means in small groups. However, 
the central idea of this text seems to be the prayer of faith spoken of in verse 15. Again, the central idea, most, commentator, most commentators recognize that as well, that uh, the central idea here is the prayer offered in faith in verse 15. Again, note that uh, it is the prayer of faith that restores the sick. And I'm going to isolate that passage for you. And the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick. And this idea of faith-filled prayer continues in the text beyond here to verse 16 where it says the effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. And so, so there's a lot of emphasis in this passage on prayer and the way prayer affects divine healing. He puts a great deal of emphasis upon prayer of faith in the pursuit of divine healing. And with this in mind, I want to spend our time this morning attempting to unpack what the prayer of faith means practically. Uh, so this, you know, what, what, what does the prayer of faith mean is kind of what we want to do here. What does it mean to pray in faith? This morning we're going to attempt to answer this question by looking at three components of faith-filled prayer which appear in other New Testament accounts of Jesus healing miracles as well. So we're going to start with the most basic one. Again, if you, have, if you don't have an outline, there's some up on the bistro tables. It's a pretty simple outline this morning. But what we're looking at here is, what is the prayer of faith? And there are three components that we can see from other New Testament accounts to help us wrap our minds around what it means to pray in faith. Okay? So here's the first. First, the prayer of faith has confidence in God's ability to heal. Uh, the prayer of faith has confidence in God's ability to heal. In other words, the prayer of faith is one that goes to God with a genuine confident confidence that he has the power, the ability, to grant our request. And this is a basic thing, but it is essential. And it's an essential component to the prayer of faith. And I would argue that not everyone has it. And we see an example of this in the book of Mark chapter 9, where a man came to Jesus pleading for Jesus to deliver his son who was possessed by a demon. And as he made his appeal to Jesus, this is what he said. Uh, this is a man, I, I, if, I, if I remember right, this passage is when Jesus is coming down off of the Mount of Transfiguration and his disciples were not able to deliver the demon. Um, so this is what he was describing here. It says, he has often thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. Notice what he says there. If you can do anything, take pity on us. And note Jesus' reply here. Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible to him who believes. You see how he's addressing those words. The guy asks, says, if you can help, he says, if, you, what are you talking about? If, all things are possible to him who believes. And so the man who made this request was not even sure that Jesus had the power to help. And Jesus identified this as a deficiency in his faith. And the man responded by asking God to strengthen his faith. Uh, immediately, the boy's father cried out and said, I do believe, help my unbelief. And so he sa he's saying, I want to believe, I'm trying to believe, help me where I'm short, meet me where I am. Uh, the man was doing the right thing here, and he did receive the deliverance he was looking for. But what we learn here is that when we go to Jesus for divine healing, or anything else for that matter, we must first have that basic confidence in his ability to grant our request. Now, if we stop and think about it for a minute, the fact that we are going to him at all and asking him for things demonstrates some level of confidence in God's ability. But oftentimes, our faith can be weak, it can be deficient, like the father of the demon-possessed boy who asked Jesus if he had the ability to help. You know, if you, if, if you think about it, we go to Christ and we say, uh, do, do you think you can handle this? Is this something that you might be able to handle with, handle on my behalf, maybe, that kind of a thing. That is the kind of thing we're talking about here where we're not even really sure that he's able to deal with it. It might be too big for him. Uh, that kind of faith doesn't cut it. Uh, what we need is a strong confidence that God is able to grant what we are asking for. And what does this kind of faith look like? We see it generally in the energy that is invested and the obstacles that are overcome in the process of making the request. And there are many many examples of this in the New Testament, and I think it might be worthwhile to spend some time here and look at a couple of them just so you can see what this looks like playing out. So we're going to just take a few minutes here, and we're going to look at some passages. One example is seen in the passage that we looked at yesterday, and it is in Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, which is why I told you guys to go ahead and turn to Mark 2 to begin with. We read this last time, 
Um, not yesterday. I'm not sure why he said yesterday. We, we saw this last time, um, last Sunday, and we're going to look at it again. Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. It says, When he had come back to Capernaum several days afterward, it was heard that he was at home, and many were gathered together so that there was no longer room, not even near the door, and he was speaking the word to them. And they came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. Being unable to get to him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him, and when he had dug an opening, they let down the pallet which was on which the paralytic was lying. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. And we're going to stop right there, even though we know there's more. Note that the men carrying the paralytic had to brave huge crowds just to get to the house itself. And when they saw that there was no way in, they climbed onto the roof of the house, they dug an opening in the roof, and they lowered him down in front of Jesus. And the text shows us that Jesus looked up and saw what the men had done. And when he saw this, he responded to it as evidence of their faith in his ability to heal. Um, and this is why we see here in verse 5, Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. What, was he, what does it mean when it says he saw their faith? He saw what these men went through just to get this guy in front of Jesus. He saw that as faith. Uh, they were very confident in his ability to help him, and he responded to that. Does that make sense? Okay, another example can be seen in Mark 5. This is the same idea, we just see it in a different account. Mark chapter 5, verses 25 through 34. We'll stay in Mark so it's easier to just flip a few pages over. <clears throat> Mark 5, 25. A woman who had a hemorrhage for 12 years and had endured much at the hands of many physicians and had spent all that she had and was not helped at all, but rather had grown worse. After hearing about Jesus, she came up in the crowd behind him and touched his cloak, for she thought, if I just touch his garments, I will get well. Immediately the flow of blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her affliction. Immediately Jesus, perceiving in himself that the power proceeded from him and had gone, for, had gone forth, turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my garments? And the, his disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing in on you, and you say, who touched me? And he looked around to see the woman who had done this, but the woman, fearing and trembling, aware of what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. And so here we see the woman with the flow of blood being so sure of God's ability to heal her that she pressed through a crowd just to touch his cloak. And when she was identified and brought to Jesus, he saw this as faith. And we see this in verse 34. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. He saw the energy and the effort that she put into it as evidence that she was confident in his ability to heal. And you remember in the text, she's like, if I can just touch his cloak. She was so sure of his ability. She's like, if I can just touch his cloak, I don't even need to ask him. If I can just touch him, I will be healed. And he responded by saying to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. And note what Jesus said here exactly. Your faith has made you well. Your faith has made you well. This lines up with the claim in the book of James that the prayer offered in faith will restore the sick. What does he mean? This is what he's talking about here. He said, Jesus, Jesus says something similar. Your faith has made you well. There's another example I want to look at too. It is Mark chapter 10, verses 46 through 52. Then we'll be done. Mark 10. 46. It says, Then they came to Jericho, and as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a large crowd, a beggar named Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the road. And when he heard that it was Jesus the Nazarene, he began to cry and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many were sternly telling him to be quiet, but he kept crying out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, Come, or call him, to, call him here. So they said, called the blind man, saying to him, Take courage, stand up. He is calling for you. Throwing aside his cloak, his, his cloak, excuse me, he jumped up and came to Jesus, and answering him said, What do you want me to do for you? 
And the blind man said to him, Rabbi, Rabbi, I want to regain my sight. And Jesus said to him, Go, your faith has made you well. And immediately he regained his sight and began following him on the road. And so here we have a blind man who, when he heard that Jesus was passing by, began shouting at the top of his lungs for help. And he refused to be silenced by those around him. They said, Be quiet. He just kept screaming all the more. And Jesus recognized this as faith in blind Bartimaeus. And he said something to him very similar to the last text. Jesus said to him, Go, your faith has made made you well, and immediately he regained his sight and began following Jesus on the road. That same thing, your faith has made you well. This is the prayer of the faith. This is the prayer of faith that restores the sick. This is how it works. And so part of praying in faith is possessing the confidence in God's ability to heal. Now to be clear, this is not confidence that God will heal us. We don't know if God will do it or not, but it's confidence that he can. And that's all the faith that we need to be able to do this. And so my question to you is this, are you confident that God can heal you? And if you are confident that he can heal you, if he can respond to your requests, do you ask him for these things? Do you ask him for healing? Do you put those things out there uh, that you desire? If you don't, ask yourself why. What does it indicate if you don't go to him and ask him for things, if you are confident that he can grant them? So that's the first. The second component is similar to the first, but it's worth mentioning on its own. The prayer of faith has respect for God's authority to heal. The prayer of faith has respect for God's authority to heal. In other words, the prayer of faith involves approaching God as one who possesses an authority that you don't have. So to explain the difference here, Confidence in God's ability, which is what we just talked about, is demonstrated in the energy we invest going to God with our requests. But respect for God's authority is demonstrated in how we speak to God when we're in his presence. So confidence is in the energy we expend getting to him. Um, respect is how we speak to him when we're in his presence. And this becomes important when we consider the way some of the examples of praying in faith are modeled on television and around us. And just for a brief moment, I'm going to ask you to reflect back to the clip that we watched last week uh, where we were talking about the flu. Um, remember the way prayer was deployed. You know, Jesus, we claim your healing. I bind you flu in the name of Jesus and such things as that. And think about it for a second as we use those examples. Does this sound like a person who is making humble requests to someone in authority? Or does it sound like a person making bold declarations as though they themselves possess the authority? Does that make sense? You see the difference? Is when we look at that kind of stuff that we see, is that someone making a request humbly to someone in authority? Or is that someone making bold declarations as though they're the ones that have the authority? Um, it, it's kind of the latter. and It kind of doesn't really line up with what we see in the New Testament. You have to ask yourself, is that really even prayer at all? Uh, Paul speaks of prayer this way, you know, just in general making requests of God. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Prayer at its core is a request. It's not a demand. It's not a claim. It's a request. With all this in mind, pr the prayer of faith that James was speaking of in our text involves approaching God who possesses authority that we don't have and humbly asking him to exercise his power on our behalf. That's what it is. Simple as that. It's a request to him who has authority we don't. Now, in this world, we don't make demands of those in authority over us when we have requests. Try to think of a big example of someone who has an authority that we don't, but um, if you can think of the example of like a family member in prison, uh, and we want to seek the president for a pardon for them, um, if we were granted an audience with the president of the United States to do that, we wouldn't claim it from him or her. We wouldn't demand it from him or her because they are the ones that are in authority, and we are not. It would be kind of foolish to approach it that way, and we know it. We don't approach any, any worldly authority that way. So why then do so many go around making claims and demands of the God of the universe. Generally, we petition the authority of this world humbly. And generally, we're great, and generally, we're grateful to be heard by them. So why then would we not approach the God of the universe the same way? 
And this is exactly what Paul was teaching in Philippians 4, which is the, the same verse again. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. He is the king of the universe. He has authority. We don't. Be thankful that you can make the request. Bring some humility into the process. Humbly bring your request to God. Be thankful that he's hearing them. This isn't about being terrified of God. It's simply about having a healthy respect for the person that you're talking to. Does that make sense? That's what we're talking about here. We see this principle on display in the way that the centurion approached Jesus to heal his servant. And we see this in Matthew chapter 8, verses 5 through 10. So turn with me to Matthew now. Matthew 8, 5 says, When Jesus entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, imploring him and saying, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, fearfully tormented. Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. But the centurion said, Lord, I am not worthy for you to come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I am also a man under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my slave, do this, and he does it. Now when Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who were following, truly I say to you, I have not found such great faith with anyone in Israel. And we're going to leave it right there. We see here in this example tremendous awareness of the authority that Jesus had in the part of the centurion. And this is why he said, just say the word and my servant will be healed. Just say the word, my servant will be healed. But this awareness is combined with great humility in his approach, which is why he said, Lord, I'm not worthy for you to come under my roof. So he's both aware of the authority that Jesus had, and he's also very humble about the way that he approaches him. And what's most fascinating about this is that the centurion was a person of considerable authority in his own right. He was accustomed to giving commands and making claims. And that's why he said in verse 9, I am also a man under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes. And to my slave, do this, and he does it. However, all this did is make the centurion all the more aware of just who it was he was talking to, and it caused him to be all the more humble. Jesus, for his part, interpreted this as great faith, and he responded accordingly in verse 10. Now when Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who were following, Truly I say to you, I have not found such great faith with anyone in Israel. And so the prayer of faith is both confidence in God's ability combined with appropriate respect for God's authority. He has the authority, not us. Therefore, we humbly request of him. But we do it with confidence because we know he has the the authority and the ability to grant our requests. Lastly, the prayer of faith is the audacity of, to request of God to heal. The audacity. Um, Now, um, please pardon the word audacity there. Um, I just, I'm a preacher and I saw the ability to have uh, three points with starting with the letter A and you just can't resist that. So uh, honestly, boldness would be better. You know, in other words, the prayer of faith is boldly going before the king of the universe and asking him for something huge, as bold and as audacious as it may be. That's what we're talking about here, going and making the big ask, the big, bold, audacious ask. Now, by audacity, we're referring to the literal, literal act of just putting it out there and seeing what happens. For example, I'm just painting hypotheticals here, but uh, this is the kind of stuff that we might think of. My mother has stage four cancer, and the doctor says she has a month to live but it's in your power and authority to heal her. Would you heal her? Imagine someone asking that. There's no hope given medically, but you can heal her. Would you heal her? My brother is paralyzed from the neck down. He's confined to a wheelchair for the rest of his life, but it's within your power and authority to heal him and make him walk. Would you do that? Bold, audacious, huge thing to ask. That's the prayer of faith. It's just going for it. It's asking for that audacious thing and saying, what's the worst thing that could happen? What do I have to lose? The worst thing that could happen is that God could say no. But what if he says yes? You'll never know if you don't ask. This is what James meant when he said, you do not have 
because you do not ask. That's what he means. You don't have because you're not putting your requests out there. You're not asking him. This isn't about demanding. This isn't about claiming. This is about just going boldly to the throne and making your requests known, just asking him. And to be clear, James is not saying that God will give you everything that you ask for, far from it. But he is saying that you will never receive anything from God if you don't ask. Right? You have to be audacious. Sometimes you just have to put it out there and boldly go for it. In the same way, when James says the prayer of offered in faith will restore the sick, he's not saying, you know, if you can just whip up belief in yourself that you're going to get it, if you can just make yourself believe that he will do it for you, then you're going to get it. That's not what he's saying here. What he's saying is it's only those willing to go before God, the God of the universe, and make those big, bold, audacious requests. Those are the only ones that have any chance of receiving it. That's what he's talking about here. He's not talking about whipping yourself up and making yourself believe something that you really can't know. He's saying the ones who don't get are the ones who don't ask. The ones who receive, receive because they ask. And all the New Testament examples we looked at are people uh, receiving healing from God because they were bold enough to put their request out there, scary as it may be. Um, and if you think about it, blind Bartimaeus, Bartimaeus, when he heard that Jesus was walking by, he had nobody to help him, no one to lead him. So what did he do? He just started screaming and shouting, and he didn't care what anyone else said. He just went for it, bold and audacious. The paralytic's friends, they couldn't get to Jesus with him, but they had confidence that he could help, and, and they, they were not going to let this opportunity pass them by, and so they climbed up on the roof of a house, peeled back the roof, and stuck him right down there in front. Is that bold and audacious? Absolutely. Sure. But that's just the kind of thing that Jesus was looking for, and he responded to that. That's the way this works. The boldness to ask things of people is something that all of us struggle with. I think that's kind of the issue here. Even in our relationship with our fellow man, asking people for things is hard. We struggle. Um, at Wegmans, they have these United Way drives where the cashiers are expected to ask everyone that comes through if they would like to, do to, do to donate to United Way. It's really a struggle for some people just to simply say, hey, would you like to round up for United Way? There's people that really, really struggle with that. They are very uncomfortable about that. Um, that's why careers and sales have such attrition in them. It's because you've got to put it, put your, got to be bold and audacious and say, will you purchase this thing? Will you buy this thing? Will you commit in this way? And you've got, got to not take their nose as a personal rejection. This is also why churches struggle for volunteers. All, off, all too often when you hear of churches that are struggling and saying, I can't get anyone to come to events or I can't get anyone to volunteer for things. Um, all too often when you really look into it, you find out that they're not really asking people to help. They're just putting announcements in the bulletin and annoyed that people aren't responding. You understand? You've got to be bold. You've got to be audacious and you've got to ask for things in this present world. And in the same way, that's what happens with God. We have to put our needs, our desires out there. And I think that we, that for the same reason that we get punked out on asking for things in this world, the same thing goes true with God. For example, I can't ask God to heal my mom of stage four cancer. It's just too big a thing to ask. God's just going to say no anyway. So why bother? Do you ever think that way? Why bother? You know? And it's not that you don't think he can. It's like, it's just kind of, isn't it a little bit too big? You know, he could, but he's not going to. We already know he's going to say no, so why bother asking? Or I can't uh, ask God to heal my quadriplegic brother because it's just too big, and he's just going to say no, and so why bother asking? Do you see how you're actually ma you're making the decision for God? You're, you're saying no before you even ask, and you're guaranteeing that it's a no. James says that you, not, you do not have because you do not ask. Um, you can have c confidence in God's ability, but if you don't put your requests out there, you're not going to get it. And yes, asking for that big miraculous thing is intimidating. And I promise you that if you do ask boldly for things from God, you are going to get no's a lot. It's going to happen. There's no way around that. But you still need to ask. And the fear of no keeps many people from asking. And so what I want to do is spend just our last couple minutes talking very briefly about what 
uh, no answers don't mean. Okay, because we're going to ask and we're going to get no's. But these are the things that no does not mean. Okay, firstly, no does not mean that God is personally rejecting you. When you ask for something bold and audacious from God, and he doesn't answer, or he clearly indicates that the answer is no, it does not mean that he does not love you, he does not care about you, he doesn't like you, or he likes others more than you, or something along that line. It simply is not true. Uh, Jesus was sent for the whole world. Um, our, redemption, our redemption was purchased at the cross. We are part of God's family equally with everyone else, and all that is based upon what Christ did on our behalf, okay? Um, more often than not, uh, when you get a no from God, it simply means that in the big picture of things that God can see, and we can't, the situation is better served by not granting the request rather than granting it. It really is that simple. We talked about this a little bit last week. Sometimes the overall kingdom interests and the overall spiritual well-being in a situation is served by not healing rather than healing. Sometimes it's served by healing. Sometimes it's served by not. And when he says no, it's usually just because the, it's in our best interest for him not to do it. And if you stop and think about it, have you ever asked God for something and then looked back in your life and said, boy, I'm glad he didn't answer that question with a yes. There has been plenty of times that I've begged God to do things for me. And now I can look back and say, boy, whew, thank you for saying no to that. You know what I mean? And it's because he saw the big picture. That's what it means. It doesn't mean that he doesn't like you or he's rejecting you personally. Next, no does not necessarily mean that you have spiritual problems. It doesn't necessarily mean that there's sin in your life that's hampering your ability to, pr to pray or it's hampering your prayers from being received. I suppose those things are a possibility, but more often than not, it's not going to be that. Uh, why do I say that? Because generally speaking, the willingness to boldly approach God's throne and ask for big things indicates strength in faith, not weakness in faith. Usually those of us who are weak in faith or struggling are the ones who are not asking. All right? If we're asking... If we're comfortable enough to go to his throne and make big requests of him, um, that's usually a sign of strength and good things. And w throughout the New Testament, when we see people doing that, uh, it's usually a win for them. It's a good sign. So even if you get a no, you're probably tracking in the right direction if you're asking. Lastly, no does not necessarily mean no forever. Just because you get a no now doesn't mean God has decreed that no will be the answer forever. You pray for healing now, and you don't receive it now. That doesn't mean never ask again, it's, or that God's going to be angry if you ask again. Take the no and ask later, unless God tells you otherwise. And continue to ask. Continue, continue to ask. Just accept the answer that he gives you. No, maybe now isn't a good time, but later will be a good time. You just don't know. The same thing that is true for this world oftentimes is true in our relationships with God. Um, there are times that you will ask people for things in this world. Do you want to volunteer? Do you want to help? Do you want to do this thing? And they'll say no. No doesn't mean no forever. No means now's not a good time. Ask again in six months. You know, isn't a bad thing to do the same thing with God. Ask again. If he doesn't want you to ask anymore, he'll tell you. If not, ask. So, my encouragement to you in conclusion would be don't guarantee no in your life by refusing to ask God for things. If there's big things that you desire, if there's big healings that you, or requests of any kind that, you, that are on your heart, ask God for them and let him be the one to decide no. Have that clarity. I think it's probably safe to say that we don't come to God and ask for things enough. And I guess we all have our different reasons for doing that, but he's not going to get angry at you. Um, he's going to receive you. And part of being able to experience the divine healing in the atonement that the Word of God promises is simply asking for it. If we don't ask for it, we're not going to get it. We're not going to experience it. Do you follow me? Now with that said, let's pray, shall we? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you have provided for our physical healing as well as our spiritual healing, and you hear our requests patiently and with care. Father, if there are anyone in here, if there is anyone in here that has healing needs or just 
any need for that matter, I pray that you'd give them the boldness to request it of you in faith. Strengthen our faith, bolster our faith. Help us to request of you so that we can experience more of what you have to offer. And we ask these things in Jesus' name, amen.